might want that. Okay, so we are being recorded. Um, but the, um, one of the lovely things about Shawl at the moment is that actually I've been following the Cedra, which is something that I don't always get a chance to do. Also, you're expected to kind of be there from the beginning. You know, all the things that we, we didn't necessarily do pre-COVID are now quite, it's a, it is a very different Shawl experience. And for me to sit through and follow through every word of Bereshit, now you might think that that's something that I've done quite a few times. To be honest with you, I probably last learned Bereshit properly inside when I was about five or six years old. Now it's mm. not that I haven't reflected on certain parts of the story, but to actually go through it verse by verse, you know, it's a long time since I've had that opportunity and my understanding's changed a lot as well. And by going through it, I gained so much. So in the past few weeks, there have been three incredible women that I wanted to touch base with and I wanted to, to look together with you to understand who these incredible women are. But even more than that, what I really want to do is I want to reflect on the connection they have to us. So rather than just thinking about them as people who lived a very, very long time ago, who are kind of completely out of touch with modern day life, let's try to view it from a completely different perspective. Let's try to look at these women and see who were they and what, do, what connection do I have with them? What can I learn from these women's lives? So I'm going to share my screen, hopefully, if this will work. Um, yep, this should work. I've, I've made a little PowerPoint. Um, there is quite a lot of text on it, but I'm going to speak about most of it outside the text. Um, how do I? Sorry, I'm just trying to see how I can play from the beginning. Quite tricky getting the mm. balance right with the with Zoom. This is my problem. Um, to move this. So hopefully you can all see mm. my picture. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. probably at the moment you've got a line across it. So let's see yeah. that. I'll put that down here. Let's see if that works. Okay, now the only other problem is I can't see any of you. I'm not sure I can change that. Okay. So if you want to ask questions or comment, then please do so unmute yourself and please do so what i'm going to do is i'm going to go through um some of the material and i'll stop after each one um and this is really not just a uh, kind of listen to what i have to say what i really would like is for uh, once we've finished describing each of the women i'd like everyone to kind of give their advice almost as if we were having like a you know, if you would write into one of these ladies' magazines and you were, you know, what, what are they calling? Ask, um, you know, your, your agony aunt kind of idea. What would you be your advice or what would be your take on some of the challenges of, that these women are going through? So what, as we know from Thursday, we're going to be heading back home. And really the home is something that we as women should be incredibly proud of. Um, the there is a verse in Proverbs in Mishle, which says as follows. It says, Chachmat nashim bantabesa, which this English has translated at it as, the wisest of women builds her house. Except it isn't really very accurate. And I'll tell you why. Because if you wanted to say the wisest, the wisest woman, which is kind of what it's trying to say, you wouldn't say chachmot nashim, that's in plural, that means the wisest women. You would say chachmat isha, like the, wis the wisdom of the woman, the singular woman. But instead we say the wisdom of women collectively, and then we say banta, it, she builds beta, her house, singular. 
So what we're saying with this is a lovely way of understanding it is that actually the way to build a Jewish home is not just about one of us building our own home. It's about us taking the collective wisdom of all the women who came before us and using that to build our home. So as we head back indoors and we head back into our home, we're going to take some of the lessons from these three incredible women and see how we can use those to be able to, to build our own home. Now, the first woman that we're going to, to speak about, and I'm not going to read the English inside, I've just put it on there in case any of you like visuals, you can start reading through the, the actual text. Um, for those of you who are on the Bat Mitzvah Revisited course, you will remember we did speak about the idea of when um, Chava was created or when woman was created and the idea of her being an Ezer Konegdo, which we, we translated as a helper in a positive sense, someone who empowers other people, gives strength to other people. You'll recognize this um, chapter in Bereshit it starts with Vayachulu Hashamayim Vaharetz, which is how we start Kiddush. So this is, everything's been done, everything's been created, but then there's a problem. Adam's on his own, and Hashem said, let us build Eve, let, let us build woman. Sorry, she's first called woman. But what's interesting then, so, so Chava comes along, or well, at that point, she's not yet called Chava, she's called woman. The woman comes along to empower man. She's there to compliment him. They're not created as one greater and one lesser. Actually, one of the, my favorite ways of understanding who Chava was, was that they were it was as if they were two people that were merged into one. So you had a female side and a male side. That's originally how Adam was created. And then when God came and put Adam to sleep, he removed the feminine side. So now you have two separate beings. But they were actually originally two halves of a whole or two parts of a soul. They were one soul that was then separated. So that's this, this idea of Chava. There are different explanations as well, but I like that one because I think that shows that they were they, they are equal partners. You have the, e the equalness of men and women, but they are different, right? We know that women bring something else to the mix. We describe the Garden of Eden, this amazing garden where Chava lives in. Um, again, Chava's not named till right at the end of the story, but we describe this garden that they live in, and it's unbelievable, the garden that they live in. So again, just to clarify, there's no way that what Chava was doing has anything to do with washing and cleaning and cooking and ironing and anything like that because in the garden of Eden none of that existed right they didn't have to do any of that you you if you wanted cake you reached out and you grabbed some cake off the nearest tree you had everything taken care of they didn't wear clothes can you imagine there was no laundry there was no drying and hanging in the bane of my existence trying to pair socks none of that existed right that was not that was not part of what the garden was all about. So we have this idea of Chava, um, or of, of woman that was created, and she was there. The only thing that they were told to do was not to eat from the tree. They were allowed to do everything else. The only thing they were told to do was not to eat from the tree. And as we all know the story, what happened is Chava ate from the tree, woman ate from the tree. What happened was the serpent came up to her and said to her, this is very interesting, because the serpent says to her, Originally, when Hashem told them not to eat from the tree, he says, you, you can eat from every tree in the garden except from the tree of knowledge of good and bad. And then Chava says to the snake, you mustn't eat and you mustn't touch the snake. And our sages tell us that Adam was trying to protect Chava to make sure that she wouldn't come to eat from the tree. So he added his own mitzvah. He added his own extra stringency. And he said, don't even touch the tree. One of the lessons we can learn from here is it's okay if you want to be extra strict or extra from or extra careful about something, but you need to know what is actually the halacha, what's actually the law, and what's actually you are putting on top of it. What's really interesting is if we would take this and we put it with the whole COVID regulations at the moment, and I've heard different people describing it. It's so interesting. A few different people have told me how it really is like religion, right? The idea of how you how you interact or how you you react with the different social distancing laws you know Kathy you just described about the porch or different people how they wear the mask when they wear the mask it's fine to have your own interpretation you know what the law is 
but it's very interesting how some people have become very judgmental of other people in terms of how they keep the law. This mm -hmm. lesson from Adam and Chava is quite interesting. If you don't know what is actually required and you don't know what's extra to that, then you can very easily think, oh, I did this thing that was extra and nothing happened, which is exactly what happens here with Chava. The snake pushes her against the tree and she says, look, nothing happened to me. If I'm allowed to touch the tree, then that must mean that I can eat from the tree as well. So she eats from the tree. And as we know, the first thing that she does is she quickly rushes over to her husband, to Adam, and she makes him eat from the tree as well. Adam eats from the tree. Um, Hashem says to them, where are you? And they kind of, they hide and they're embarrassed, which is also really interesting. Until that point, they're not embarrassed at all by the fact that they're not wearing any clothes. Suddenly they're aware that they're naked and they become embarrassed and they hide from Hashem. And then Hashem tells them the consequences of their, of their sins. And we're going to look at those in a second together. But before we do, can anyone maybe try to share with all of us, what do you think Chava could have been thinking? So maybe we can say, I'm going to ask a few questions, actually. The first one is, what was Chava thinking that she listened to the snake in the first place that she ate from the tree? And then when she did that terrible thing wrong, why on earth would she bring her husband into it as well? Why would she give him from the, the tree as well? What, like, what was she thinking? So if anyone wants to unmute themselves, think about why, what is going on with Chava? What's she doing in this story? Do you, do you think she's testing, testing the atmosphere, testing to see what will happen to her? So I think, I think you're right, Kathy. I think she's been given one thing to do. And I think we can all agree, we can all appreciate this. If you're told, you know, I don't expect anything of you, except this is the one thing you're not to do. I know many people on here are educators. And if you think in terms of education or, or in, in terms of healthcare, very often you'll say, you know, you can have whatever you want. Just this is the one thing that you mustn't do. That suddenly becomes the most tempting thing in the world. We all know that, don't we? Mm. If you're told that, you know, your sugar, your sugar, you really need to look after your sugar level. The one thing you cannot eat is sugar. What's the one thing that you're going to crave more than anything else in the world is sugar. So I think you're right. I think she was testing the boundaries. It's like the one thing she's been told is not to eat from the tree. And it's just so tempting now. That tree suddenly becomes like the one thing she wants to do. Elaine. No, it's, I think it's almost down to testing. Um, when you can't have something, you're testing yourself as to whether you can control your desires and it becomes greater than anything you could possibly imagine it takes over your life yeah I think you're right I think that this like being told no is such a difficult thing for us as human beings right it's like I, I can if I if I'm telling myself no that's one thing but someone else to tell me no is this testing of it it, it almost feels like it's more than I can bear and, and again, if we take this now to modern day, the things that we're dealing with now, I think we can all um, sympathize with people who are really struggling with restrictions right now, because we, as human beings, we're not great at restrictions. And I'm not agreeing with anyone who's rioting or who's, you know, behaving in a way that's endangering other people. Of course not. But I think that we can all understand that people don't like being told what to do. I think it makes us almost feel like children again, doesn't it? When someone tells us what to do. It's like, who are you to tell me what to do? I want my freedom to think the way that I want to, or to do what I want to do. One of the really beautiful explanations about Chava um, and Adam, what happened, was it, it was a little bit like they, they knew God had given them one commandment, but they felt that if they would break this commandment, God would be so much happier about what they could now rebuild. It's almost like if you have a vase and you decide, actually, I want to smash the vase so that I can build something even more beautiful. And I think that was part of their reasoning as well. They felt if we could break this, what we're going to remake is going to be so much bigger. And in some ways, the sages tell us, in some ways, they were right. Except Hashem said not to. 
So their reasoning in some ways wasn't even flawed, but Hashem said to them not to. Now, what's really interesting is if we look at, and I wonder, has anyone ever looked at in detail what the 10 curses that were given to Chava, to a woman, was because of this sin? So I'm going to share the screen again. Um, and um, yeah. I'm going to share my screen with you, hopefully. So this one is... Um, this is, I took from a book, called I think it's called to be a Jewish woman and what's right you can all read them inside you can see what the the what what changes happened to Chava what's the, the changes to Adam we're not we're not studying Adam now but they were very much to do with working the ground and um, agriculture and having to work for a living so actually you know again we might view the fact that Adam that that mankind has to go get a job as a positive thing but we shouldn't forget that actually it was a curse. It was a negative consequence for doing something wrong. In the same way, if you look at the curses of women, that there are lots of things in here that, that are part of what we identify as a woman's kind of role. And I know it's interesting to look at them in terms of you know, the more feminist um, kind of perspective, but that they, these are all things that women can experience during their lifetime. Um, but that it's all very interesting. It's very much connected to the woman's body and to do with childbirth and to do with um, a woman's connection to that. And again, these are all things that you can spin them really beautifully. And you can talk about, you know, people will talk about things like natural childbirth and, and being able to, you know, not, not needing epidurals and having a wonderful experience and all of that, which is wonderful. And I don't know if you've, you've come across people like that. There are people who will talk about you know, these, these um, amazing earthy kind of mothering kind of experiences, which is wonderful. But at the end of the day, this was given to Chava as a curse. So we have to remember that all of these things were a negative consequence for her actions. And, you know, those are all very relevant to all of us throughout our life cycle. Um, in fact, in, in two women's hours time, so at the end of the month of November, we're going to have the charity Chana going to be doing a presentation with different stories of women who've accessed their ser services throughout their life cycle. So it's not just, I mean, Chana is primarily offering people fertility um, who have fertility challenges support, but actually they offer support to people throughout their different stages of, of, of womanhood. But um, that that's going to connect in quite interestingly, but it is it is something that women have to deal with you know throughout their lives so that's Jacqueline, Jacqueline, yeah why would number 10 be a curse a woman would desire to stay home so it's really it is really interesting because you know we started off by saying that a woman being in the home is the ideal or the the fact that the 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 the, the the multiple women build a home and it, even in the Gemara sometimes a woman is is referred to as the home so we have a very positive spin on this and I think that we have such wonderful things to say about being at home but Kathy I'm going to throw the the question back at you why do you think that that could be a curse or, or does anyone maybe, want the, to what, maybe the woman wants to go out and be part of the world and having to stay at home, she would consider that detrimental. I mean, women nowadays don't, the majority of them want to be out and um, have their own careers, et cetera, and not be homemakers. But yeah. I just think at that time, why that was a curse, I've no idea. I, th I'm, I think that they might have felt they were in isolation from the rest of society. Really? It's yeah. going to be very interesting because, yeah, when we get to Sarah, she's praised for being a woman of the home. And that's obviously post sin. So taking this role on and making it into something special is viewed as something very positive in the same way that, you know, childbirth being something positive is, you know, something that that that's viewed positively or a woman being shy about her body and being modest about it is something that's viewed positively. But it is interesting with all of those, and, and you know, we could go through each of them, which we're not going to now, but it's very interesting that with, for all of those, 
what could be viewed as now like a mitzvah or a positive mindset wasn't originally made like that. So Chava wasn't originally meant to be the homemaker. She was meant to be the Ezer Konegdo. That's how she's described, which is the enabler opposite him or the empowerer opposite him. She wasn't meant to be the person who is the home. She then became that after her sin. Just like man wasn't meant to go out and work. That wasn't what he was meant to be doing. So it is interesting. I, like, I think it's a fascinating question, actually. Um, what I think is also really interesting, and this is something that we're going to end with as well later on, is that nowadays this has changed so much. So with feminism, yeah. and I asked them, um, there's somebody called Rabbi Moshe Weinberger. Um, with, I was at a Q&A with him. He is the... I think he's the Mashkiach of Yeshiva University. He's Hasidic, um, an amazing speaker, an amazing man, very, very holy soul. And he has a shawl in, I think, Woodmere, one of the five towns, I think. Um, and his shawl actually is named after um, someone who was killed, one of the big rabbis who was killed in the Holocaust. He kind of continues on his legacy. But um, someone was asking about, you know, how do you deal with this very loud voice that we now have of women who want to be like men, this like voice of women as feminists. And actually the way he said it, I thought was quite derogatory. I didn't like the way he was speaking, not because I'm one of those women, because I, I'm actually very proud that we've got very different roles, but I just found it, it it's important that when you ask a question like that you can hear where the other person's coming from that's always something that i've felt um and what he said which was really beautiful and we'll we'll connect with what we we're going to look at at the end was he spoke about the idea that um he said that when the moon and the sun were originally created they were the same size and then what happened was the do you remember the story the moon complained to hashem and said you can't have two beings that are the same size. So Hashem said, fine, I'll make you smaller. And then when Mashiach comes towards the end of days, you will come to be the same size again. And we know that women are compared to the moon. That's our connection with Rosh Chodesh. We're always, and we've got the cycle, and we're very connected to the moon. And women had a similar idea that they had this idea that men, which we've seen throughout our history, men were I'd say the more dominant gender they were the ones who were more out there they were the ones that were doing and being and you know I don't need to go far back in my own family if I look to my grandparents where you know my grandmother even though she was one of the most intelligent women I knew couldn't go to university it was just not an option for her right it's changed and things are changing so much and what Rabbi Weinberger said which I love was he said as we're coming towards Moshiach's time now actually the light of the women is coming more and more. The moon's light is coming out more and more. So this feminist um, agenda, I guess, I'm not saying that all of it's coming from a great place. Some of it's coming from a very distorted place, but actually, oh, sorry, some of it's coming out in a very distorted way, but the place it's coming from might be from a very good place that actually the light of the moon is getting bigger now. We need to make sure to do that in an appropriate way and in, in a positive way. And actually, it's a lovely thing that we can talk about. One of the things that Miriam's really contributed to our community. Those of you who joined last time was the um, the Women's Hallel. We're going to be having another one. Is it next Tuesday? I can't remember. What's the date, Miriam? A fortnight. It's a fortnight's time. It's Rosh, the Tuesday morning of Rosh Chodesh. Yeah, so it's in, a, in, in two weeks' time. So on Tuesday in two weeks, that's one of the ways that we can really celebrate us as women is praying together. We're doing it over Zoom. It's a really special um, thing that, that we've started now that thanks to Miriam. And it's a lovely way of bringing out the light of the moon. So as we're heading towards the time of Mashiach, and we know we are, actually the voice of women is changing and it can be in a really positive way. Now, I don't know, did anyone see... Um, there's a program someone told me about there was a program on the BBC I think called Miss, Mrs America yes yes a few of you've seen it yeah so what I found really really fascinating about that is you can see how both sides of the argument had very strong views but weren't really listening to each other 
and I, th I, I don't know, everyone I'm sure came up with different conclusions, but, <coughs> but both the feminists and the anti-feminist women were so strong and so stuck on what their way of doing things was. And I think that to me, that really shows a reflection of you, you can have this light of the moon that's coming out in such a beautiful, positive way, like us coming together for Hala, like us learning together now, like women who are pushing and doing and, and bringing, and you know, please God, we'll hear from Rachel Freer, like that are doing the most incredible, unbelievable things in society. But you can also have people who it, that same light, they're distorting it and they're doing it in a way that's immoral or that's um, pushing an agenda or that's not listening to other people or that's not being sensitive. Actually, Marcus said to me something that I didn't even know. Um, we were singing one of the songs from Mary Pop, um, yes, from Mary Poppins, the suffragette song. So I was saying, you know, sister suffragette. And she said to me, no, one of her friends said that actually you should talk about the suffragists not the suffragettes. Now, are there any history teachers on here that knows the difference? Does anyone know the difference between suffragists and suffragettes? So apparently the suffragists were not violent and destructive. They wanted the same thing, but they didn't destroy things. So I thought, how wonderful is that to have a nuanced understanding of history that actually there is a way to protest for something. There is a way to make changes. And normally it doesn't happen by bashing other people. And I think that's one of the things that I feel about feminists as well, is there is a wonderful way to bring the beauty of women into society. And, you know, I 100% think that we should have equal pay and equal rights and treated properly. But not to say that women are the same as men, because then you lose the beauty of women, which is what Chava was all about. So it's an, it is a really interesting one, um, Kathy. I'm, I'm not saying that I've got a great answer for you in terms of, of the home, but the home wasn't always what the woman was all about. Like I said to you, there was no laundry, right? I always think it's such a great image. I don't know, maybe just because laundry takes up so much of my time and it's never finished, right? It's the river that's never finished. There was no washing up. That wasn't what Chava was about when she was originally created. So it can't be that that's ideal. And I've had these sort of discussions with Robertsons who are busy telling me that, yes, the most ideal thing possible that you could do is to cook chillant. And it's wonderful if you enjoy cooking chillant. I love cooking, so I don't have a problem with that. But I do have a problem with telling all women that that's the ideal way to serve God. There isn't one ideal way to serve God. There's lots of ways to serve God as a woman from a feminine perspective. So I'm not answering your question, Kathy. I think the question's better than anything I said, but I, I just think that that's a reflection in terms of, of what we're discussing. Okay, I'm gonna go back now because I want to have time to share with you a few more to, to get to the other women as well. And I, I'm conscious of the time as well. So the next woman that we're going to come across is Mrs. Noach. And why I love this, is because I actually, I gave a class last week. Um, I, a community had asked me to talk about some of the women in Tanakh. So I said, I'll talk about Noah's wife, thinking, oh yes, of course, there must be so much to say about her. And then suddenly when I started looking into it, I was like, well, who is Noah's wife? And what do we know about her? And as I started unpeeling the layers, which is always something you see with Tara, you just see more and more depth and beauty. So. This follows on beautifully from the story of Adam and Chava because straight after Adam and Chava, what happens is the story of Cain and Abel. We're going to get back to that in a minute, but just in summary, Cain kills his brother Hevel. Cain kills Abel, right? We know that. And then afterwards, Adam and Chava have another child, almost like a child instead of Hevel, called Shaith. And we're going to go look at a, a family tree soon. But what in the book of Beresha, what it does is it tells us all the descendants of Cain. This is part of those descendants that I'm looking at now. So we have the person that I want to focus on specifically is called Lamech. What's interesting is Lamech actually ends up accidentally killing Cain. Um, that's one of the things we know about him. But Lamech took to himself two wives. He's the first person in the Torah to take two wives. 
The name of one was Ada and the name of the other was Zilla. We're not going to go through the details, but actually he's criticized for what he was doing. It was as if he took on for himself. There was one wife that he married um, when she was when he was younger, when she was younger, to be able to have children and he didn't love her. She was hated. And the other one was like his trophy wife, to be able to enjoy her, a much younger woman. This is not the idea of Jewish marriage, obviously, but this is what Lamech did. Ada bore Yavel. He was the ancestor of those who dwell in tents and amidst herds. And the name of his brother was Yuval. He was the ancestor of all who play the lyre and the pipe. As for Tzilla, this is the other wife, she bore Tubal Kain, which is interesting because it's got Cain's name in. She, so remember, Lamech is going to kill Kain. Tubal Kain continues this line of Kain and who, who forged all implements of copper and iron. And that could be to do with weapons, like Kain was killed Hevel. And also Kain was the one who, who worked the land. So again, it's um, plowing the fields. And the name of Tuval Kain, and the sister of Tuval Kain was called Naama. And the sages tell us that Naama was the wife of Noah. Now, so Tuval Kain, we said, continues that streak of Kain because he's going to be plowing the fields. He's going to be making weapons. But also what's interesting is this reflects Adam after the sin, because Adam before the sin, um, Adam was all about the animals and being in the garden with the animals. After the sin, it was, it was all about working the land. So that's the negative side. Hevel, Abel, was the one who was looking after the sheep, looking after the animal. That's like Adam before the sin. And Cain was looking after the land. That's like Adam after the sin. So what I wanted to share with you, this is very exciting for me. And when I discovered this, I said, yes, this is really cool. I need to share this with everyone. So if you look at the family tree, you can see, obviously, after Hevel, Abel, he dies because he was killed by Cain. And then that's it. That's the end of his line. In order to continue that line, Adam and Chava have um, Shase, Seth, right? That's, that's who's born instead of Hevel and his name actually means that he, Hashem has granted them a son instead of Hevel who was killed so if we follow both lines down you've got Cain you'll see a lot of the names are very similar between the two families the two lines which is interesting but what's interesting here is the bottom line of Cain's family is Naama and she gets married to the bottom line of, Adam, of um, Seth's family tree which is Noah so Noah and Naama get married the reason this is fascinating to me is because when they go into the ark, what happens to the rest of humanity? What happens to everyone else on this family tree is they all get killed. Destroyed, yeah. They're all destroyed, exactly. So Naama is actually the only remaining descendant of Cain, of Cain. And you see that on the family tree? She is the only one, Naama over here is the only one who's going to continue Cain's legacy, who's going to continue this branch of the family. Noah's the only one who continues Shasa's over here, but Naama is the only one who's going to continue this lineage. What's very interesting is the fact that, you know, again, we said we're going to try and look at them as people rather than just as names. How do we think Naama felt? How does she feel that she is the only descendant of Cain? She is continuing his genes. And actually, if you trace um, any, any time there is immorality after the Ark, it's always through Ham, which was one of their children, Ham. Um, any time there is anything like that that's inappropriate, for example, when when Pharaoh is inappropriate with Sarah or tries to be inappropriate with Sarah, you can always trace it through that line, through Ham. So it's like Naam has taken this bad gene and continued it on through the family tree. What do you think Naam feels about this? I think it's quite a difficult thing to live with, isn't it? Knowing that your continuing this trait of your great 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 grandfather you're continuing that family tree and I remember um a couple of years ago when we had the do you remember when we had the granddaughter of um the Nazi that came to speak yeah. in our shul some people were very very upset about what she had to say 
but it's a very interesting thing to live with the knowledge that you're continuing the line of, of somebody that did something really wrong, right? He was the first person that murdered and she's continuing that line. But what's interesting, I think, from our perspective is there's no such thing as purely good or purely bad, is there? It's all relative. It's it's how you use it and what you use it for. And yes, there was, Ham has some, some challenging things that happened through his line, but you've actually, you've got all three of her descendants and, and us, we come from one of her descendants, right? We come from Shane and there's lots of positive things that happen because of Naama. In fact, Naama's name, Naama, means pleasant. And Naama was a very special person because she, she brought pleasantness to everything that she did. What's interesting as well, when I was researching into this, that I didn't know, I only discovered last week when I was looking into this in more detail, was do you remember we said that Naama's father was the first person that married two wives? And it was quite immoral the way that he treated his two wives. It wasn't, this wasn't the idea of what Hashem wanted. What's fascinating is, there is, um, Rashi says, when it talks about when Cain and Hevel were born, um, the way Rashi interprets based on how the words are written, it's interpreted that Cain had one, was born with one twin sister and Hevel was born with two twin sisters. Um, if, in case you ever wondered, we only spoke about C Cain and Abel, how was there able to be any children, right? If there were only men born, they each had twin sisters and actually um, we, according to the Medrash, we learn that they married their twin sisters. Now, this is very strange because that's not something that we would be considered moral with in our standards at all. But obviously at the time, that was how humanity would continue. But one of the things that we learn is what was Cain jealous of in Hevel? He was jealous because Hevel had two twins or two wives, whereas he only had one. So when Lamach takes two wives, it's almost as if he's trying to rectify the sin of Cain by saying, I'm going to have two wives, but I'm going to do it right. And then he even names his son to Cain. He names him after Cain. He's saying, I'm going to get this right. I'm going to get this perfect. He doesn't. He messes up. But what's really interesting is we know that as part of the Jewish people, there are lots of people who have more than one wife. Right. Even we're going to when we look at Sarah, we're going to see how Sarah encouraged Abraham to take another wife. So it's really interesting. And even Yaakov, who's the father of all of us, right? Avram had one son who's the Jewish people and one son who's who Ishmael, who didn't go in the way he was meant to. But Yaakov, who we say, Mitaso shall um, Yaakov shalem, that Yaakov's bed was perfect. He had more than one wife. So it's really interesting, this idea of having lots of wives. And I think especially for us as women who are living in 2020, it's quite a challenging concept to get our heads around. Can I um, make a point? Um, on the list of 10 curses, uh, most of them we have made into uh, positive things in our generation. But there is one, I can't remember which one it was, which says no woman shall have two husbands. And it's almost can be looked at, possibly, that it's almost giving men permission to have two wives because it was not written there that they can't have two yeah. wives. Yes, and actually the only reason nowadays they're not allowed to have two wives, I always forget what century it was in, but there was, there was um, I think probably it's post-Gemara, uh, post but I can't, I'm not great with dates because they made an edict saying that you can't take two wives, but till quite recently, like as in a few hundred years ago, that was still permitted. What's really interesting is Taimani Jews, so the Jews who live in um, from Yemen, they don't have the same edict. This is an Ashkenazic edict, is that you can't have two wives. Taimanim don't have the same laws as us. al Khanan told me once he went into a cab in Israel and he started talking to the taxi driver, as you do, and the taxi driver said to him that he was from Yemen. So al Khanan said to him, ah, so you can have two wives. So he goes, let me tell you one thing. He says, one wife, small problem. Two wives, big problems <laughs> and I thought that you know I thought that was such a great thing you think like oh yeah you can have two wives but how complicated and look at throughout Tanakh how complicated this concept is for people you know every time you look at we're, we're not looking this time at but the story of Rachel and Leah it's so complex the the dynamics of having more than one wife you're right it's men are permitted to have more than one wife whereas women aren't but even to 
like, I think I don't even think it's just for us nowadays as modern women that it's hard to get our heads around it. I think it's it's always been something that's been a struggle. And actually, the Hebrew word to describe a co-wife, so someone's yes, yeah, someone's wife, someone who's married to the same husband as her, is called a tsara, a tsara, like a tsaras, right? That's how they describe it because that's what it is. It's a hard, it's a challenge. It's not a, it's not an easy thing to deal with. Thank you, Joy. That was that was a great um, insight. So. We now have Naama that she's going to be the one continuing on the legacy. But I think it's important to realize that it's not um, only negative. There's something that's very positive from every trait that you can come from. And I think it's not about who you're born to, it's what you make of your life. We sometimes discuss this when you talk about Yichus. And actually, um, when I got engaged to Elchonen, his Bobby, who's please God should be live and be well. Um, no one knows quite how old she is because she won't tell anyone, but she's Kanahara. Um, and she, when, when she wished me Mazel Tov, she was very quick to remind me about, which I didn't know about actually, but all the unbelievable people that they're related to, the Sajagon and Rapaigon, and basically you can trace their family tree straight to David HaMelech. And it's unbelievable the amount of Yichas there is in, in their family. But someone once described to me beautifully what does what yichus is all about. It's like lots of zeros. So if you have lots of yichus, you have lots and lots and lots of zeros. But unless you become a one at the front of them, it doesn't mean anything. And you could have only one zero or two zeros. And if you become a one, then you're a hundred. But if you have lots and lots of really important people that you come from, but you don't become something yourself, then it's much harder to, to see that that's something that you should be proud of. So yichus is an amazing thing. And actually, we all have amazing yichus because we all come from Abraham and Sarah and Rika and Yitzhak, right? We all come from this incredible stock, but um, it's like zeros. It depends what you make of yourself from it. So that was a little bit um, in terms of Naama. The other thing I wanted to say, which was interesting as well in terms of Naama, we described how her father, sorry, this is what I was trying to say. We described how her father, um, was was quite immoral he the the fact that he had you know um one wife for pleasure and one wife for child ch um, child rearing it was just not the way that's part of the immorality that led to the destruction of the world and what's very interesting was actually in the um ark they there's the i think it's rashi who says to us they when they talk about who goes into the ark actually the men and women were separate in the whole time that they were in the ark so there was no intimacy during that time and part of maybe what Naama was bringing to this mix or bringing to humanity was the fact that actually um, intimacy, intimacy has to be something that's very, very special and done in the right way. It can't just be something that, you know, um, in the described in the way that her father looked at or viewed the, the relationship between men and women. That's not something that was appropriate. So that's very interesting. And, and even more than that, what's interesting with Noah the first thing that he does when he comes out of the ark is actually immoral, is that he plants um, a vineyard and he gets drunk on the grapes and he acts in an, in, an immoral way. Um, again, it's with Cham. So Cham is the one that's, that's this line that we spoke about of, of not behaving correctly, of this, this line of, of immorality. But um, the idea of planting, again, comes from what Adam after the sin was about right it wasn't in the ark was all about the animals and was like this holier level and then when they came back to reality and back to normality they they got it wrong and um, again if we want to reflect on our time now we, we were in lockdown we came back to a new normal that wasn't normal at all we're going back into lockdown and I don't know about any of you but I'm busy thinking like what am I going to do differently this time What's going to be different about the time that I'm going to be in, in my arc this time? What's going to be different about how we're going to do this? When we come out again, at, please God, it should be at the beginning of December. How are we going to actually really value all the things that suddenly we are able to do? Because it's such human nature that you just start taking things for granted. So that's some of my reflections on Naama. I'm going to skip on to Sarah because I want to not run out of time. And I have a lovely song that I wanted to share with you at the end. Um, I'm going to really skip through Sarah because there's so much to say about her, but we are going to run out of time. Um, Sarah's, I love Sarah because that's my 
Hebrew name, but um, also because she is the first Jewish mother. She is the beginning of the Jewish people. Avram was the first Jewish man. Sarah was the first Jewish woman. She did outreach in the most amazing way. She cared about everyone. She brought them closer to God. Um, she's described as um, when... Um, he is described um, as they talk about Sarah being in the tent and that's really to her praise that she was modest she was in the tent she was proud of the home that she had um, which connects Kathy with what we were saying before um, and is interesting why Chava it's, it's viewed as, as a negative um, but what's interesting as well is we learn about Shalom Bayit the idea of having harmony in the home from Avram and Sarah because when, uh, when Sarah's told that Avram, who is 99 years old, is going to, is 100 years old, um, is going to have a child, Sarah laughs. And when Hashem retells this, to, uh, she's not with Avraham, when Hashem retells this to Avraham, Sarah says, how can I have a child when my husband's so old? Hashem changes it to how can I have a child when I am so old? And from here, we learn one of the really important lessons, which is how important it is to make peace. So you can even lie um, to be able to keep peace between people. That's how important it is to have shalom by it, to be to have peace. Um, Sarah, like um, all our matriarchs, has a hard time having children. She gives her maidservant Hagar to um, Avram to marry, and they have Yishmael. Yishmael is 13 years old when Yitzhak is finally born, this wonderful child that she's waited for so long. And then um, Sarah says to Avram, we're going to send away, uh, you need to send away Hagar and Yishmael because he's a bad influence. And again, that was part of what I was reflecting on is what goes on in our homes. We're the ones who are in charge of that. We're in charge of what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. What's, what's good for us in terms of our homes? What's good people for us to surround ourselves with? What's good things for us to watch or listen to, etc. That's part of what we do to be like Sarah. Um, and Avram says, no, how can I send away my son? And Hashem says, listen to her voice because she's a greater prophetess than you. So Sarah is the first prophetess and she has greater prophecy even than Avraham. Um, someone once said that um, the women in the Torah are not as important because they're mentioned much less. And I really, really, that comment bothered me. So I was with a group of other women and we a man said this, a, a teacher, a rabbi, and we got really disagreed with him very very strongly and the more I've looked into it and the more I've tried to reflect on it you don't need to say the most to have the most powerful role we all know that right sometimes you can be in the background and you can have the most powerful effect it's like the engine of the car you don't see the engine you just see the really flashy bonnet and the lovely seats and the steering wheel but you know that the engine's doing all the work you don't need to be out there but you could be behind the scenes, but you can be the force, the empower, which is what we use the word for, for Chava that keeps everything going. So that's this idea with, um, with Sarah. There's some other stories as well um, in terms of Sarah, but I am going to skip on through. Um, it describes Sarah that, what's interesting with Sarah is that the end of her life, um, it talks about how long she lived. It says she was a hundred years and seven years, and 20 years and seven years and we're told that every year of her life was she was like it was as if she had as little sin as when she was seven and she was as beautiful as when she was 20 so each part of her life she was just this amazing person and also the description of of when she how she was buried and that she was um it talks quite a lot this this is very rare to go into this sort of depth about when someone passes away and when they're buried um, normally we wouldn't be concerned with that because normally we kind of think about someone's soul but with with Sarah she was so connected spiritually to her body that even the fact that her body was buried was something that was very very spiritual because she was such a holy person but the point that I wanted to get to with Sarah was actually afterwards when her son Yitzchak finally meets the woman that he wants to marry um, and I think as the mother of lots of boys um, this is kind of, you know, the bit where you kind of think, what sort of mother-in-law will I be like, right? But it's this idea that it says that Yitzchak brought, brought his wife, Rivka, to the tent of Sarah, his mother, and he took her inside and she became his wife and she, she loved him. What's this idea of the tent of, he loved her, sorry. 
Um, and then Yitzchak was comforted after his mother. What was this idea of bringing her into Sarah's tent? What was so special about her tent? He brought her into the tent. This is Rashi says this. She became exactly like his mother, Sarah. That is to say, the words signify as much as, and he brought her into the tent and behold, she was Sarah, his mother. For while Sarah was living, a light had been burning in the tent from one Shabbos Eve to the next. So when she lit her Shabbat candles, they lasted from one Shabbat to the next. There was always a blessing in her dough. It lasted from one week to the next. It was always fresh. Um, and a cloud was always hanging over the tent as a divine protection. Since her death, all these had stopped. However, when Rebecca came, they reappeared. Now, one of the things that I love about this description is actually, first of all, these are the three women's mitzvot that it's hinting towards. The idea of lighting candles, the idea of challah, right, separating challah, and the idea of mikvah. Mikvah is to do with the holiness of Hashem's presence in the home. These are all symbolized in Sarah's tent. That's what Sarah's tent represented. But I also love the idea of this continuous chain of women, right, this continuation of, of how amazing, starting from Sarah, we all come from there, generation after generation after generation after generation. We keep continuing this incredible gift that we got from Sarah. Now, while I was preparing this class for this evening, I was, I was um, looking, I was trying to find a song that we used to sing actually when I used to go to camp. Um, sometimes we went to camp in America and I couldn't find that song, but I came across the most beautiful song that I wanted to share with you at the end. The honest truth is, um, I liked the song and wanted to share it. And then I thought of ways that it connected with what we had to say. But I think the fact that it's women singing together is so inspirational that I'm gonna share it with you anyway. Um, I wrote the words down as well, so you can follow them as we go along. And then as, the more I was thinking about it, the, this idea of the moon and the, the strength of the light of the moon coming back to us, I think there's a lot of things in the words that we could read in some of the messages from from the women that we've spoken about but even if not it's such a beautiful song i decided i'm sharing it with you anyway so this is a song it's a women's choir in israel um the, the words are all in hebrew but you can follow the the english along on the side so i'm going to share that with you now if it works if there if you can't hear it then please let me know <laughs>
איך לשאול, אני בא ללמוד ממה שטוב ולחיות. להתחיל הכל מההתחלה, כמו לנשום בפעם הראשונה, אני כאן. When I heard that song, I couldn't not share it with you. But I think this idea of this was um, the song was actually made in 2019 before all of this. But I, I just felt like it could have been written literally for us right now. Right. We, we've got this incredible light and we can feel alone, but we're not alone. And, and you know, each time we've, we've, we're each going to do things our own way. But actually, we can take some of the messages from the incredible women who came before us. to help guide us and to help um, show us really the way to go. So I hope that that's given you a little bit of a different perspective on some of the incredible women. We, we met the cast, we met three of the women from the Torah. Just to share something a little bit different, as we're heading back into lockdown, we need to really try to tap into the beauty and the wonderfulness of our home, while at the same time being real with the fact that it's challenging and it can be hard. And we could feel alone, but actually we should all reach out to each other. Um, and we are all here for each other. And the, the wisdom of all of us women to coming together will help to build each of our homes. So I wish you all a wonderful week ahead. Um, thank you for coming to join us. If there's any questions or any comments, feel free to unmute yourselves. But it was really just lovely to see you all. Thank, thank you. you very much, Jacqueline. Thank you. Really very, lovely. very, <coughs> very enlightening. Thank you. Yes, it was a, a lovely way to spend this hour with thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, so meaningful as well. I, I loved it. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. And let's keep doing it. Yeah, please, God. We'll, it will be every other week now. So we've got some Great. exciting things coming up. Okay. And, and we've thank got you. the women as well. So we've got some lovely things in the, in the diary. Good. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Keep yeah. well, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nice to see you. A lot into that, and it was it was.